All right. Rob gets his last yawn in before we start. <laughs> one last big yawn yeah, from yeah. the one and only Rob Latham, the guest this time on the <sighs> special edition of the Shooting USA podcast from the 2018 Bianchi Cup in the Holiday Inn Executive Center lobby. Rob, welcome, sir. Thank you. It's great to be here. It is great to it be here. It is great, it's to, great be here. to have you here. <laughs> it's great to have a shooting schedule that has everything wrapped up by noon o'clock. Right. Yes and no. From the shooters, one of the things that's always frustrating about this event is that once we get started, you know, we kind of want to get it done. Right. Because this, one of the stress elements at this event is the shoot once and wait and all, then wait. wait, 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 wait. But right. then that's part of the game. Well, for me, it's a it's kind of a hot and cold proposition because you know we got to get up early, we got to be out there yeah. because first shots are promptly at eight. And right. everything is scheduled on top of everything else. And yeah. if you don't have your hand on it, it's over at noon, Jack. And well, and, and you could, for you guys, you could miss half of everything that's going on. If you decided to follow me and then I'd take that day to shoot the worst of my life, then you go, God, I wish we could have co covered somebody that was actually in the game. Well, without spoiling it for everyone out there in TV land, because it isn't on TV yet, right. we made the conscious decision to follow you and Pat Franks onto the plates. First thing, first event, first deal yesterday morning. And at the same time, Adam Sokolowski was shooting his mover clean with 39X. So, I didn't even know that. I, I hadn't been, same thing. You're not being able to see everything we're not being able so to see. So, it's everything. one of those things. Yeah. It's an interesting it's an interesting thing that, you know, historically this match when it was the 3-day format before and people would shoot into the afternoon as late as 4 o'clock. Right. It would spread out quite a bit. And yeah. It was a much more relaxed pace. Now it is a much tighter pace and to their credit, they have hit the number, you know, everybody is right on time and that's right. great. Um but it's still a big challenge. Yeah, it's still a pain in the butt to try to be every place and get everything done. And I feel sorry for you guys and having to try to cover it. And you know, last year's program was cool in that they created a you know a, pre, a, a, a what do you call it a pre event event effectively that then put a qualifying every event, qualifier there you yeah, go it's sure. qualifier and then everybody basically put it after that. You got a we basically had to shoot a schedule that allowed you guys to be us to be wherever you wanted us to be. Yeah, sort of to an extent. I mean, I had to have a ton of people. Well, happening that's the problem. To get it is done. there was something happening there at four four groups were shooting at any given at time. At exactly the same time. Same time. So yep. then it was actually worse. So well, I guess it's it's manageable. And I'll never complain about it. We're blessed to be doing it. But yeah, you have been doing this a <laughs> really. Long, Long time. time. And I mean that in the kindest way. No, I understand. This is my 37th consecutive Bianchi Cup. That's got to feel great. Because well, this is 40 uh, years, so there are only three of these that you didn't, didn't participate make. in. Yeah, the, the, when I started shooting practical type events in the, in the late 70s, I didn't even know about this event. Sure. And by 80, 81... Man, this has just got to sound like so ancient history. No, this is important. People this is what I want to unpack. This is what I've been waiting to dig into. Well, the in in those early days, you know, the this was always a specialized event. that was an invitation. It was hard to get in. It was hard to be any good at it. And if you look at the scores back from the early days, the 70, 79, 80, 81 scores, I mean, you would, now you, go, you can't help but say, well, what's wrong with you guys? Couldn't you shoot? Well, right. the answer is no, we couldn't. Well, we weren't that good at it, and right. now production scores are better than than what we would shoot with open guns back then. So. Sure. It's an interesting thing, because it, it, Julie and I unpacked this a little bit in the podcast just a moment ago. There are some parallels between the four events of the Bianchi Cup, because they are known, they're measured, mm -hmm. and they don't change. Mm -hmm. The eight events of the Steel Challenge are known and measured mm -hmm. and don't change, and there was a time when that match was developed that... Breaking 80 seconds total for the match was thought to be impossible. impossible. That will never happen mm -hmm. until it has happened. Right. And that kind of leads me to the next thing, which is there's some scuttlebutt around about changing the format or the scoring format of the Spianchi Cup to make it more difficult. You know, we've talked, we've talked about doing that for decades. You know, they'll, they'll, the concept of let's get rid of the 8 and make it an, a, you know, an X10-9-8. Right. You know, and adding, adding lines to the, to the, to the sc or scoring rings to the targets. And you can make a pro and a con for it. I think in years past, if you had added a 9 ring or made the, made the I guess, make the, make the 10, make the 10 and 9, add a 10 ring and then separate it out a little bit, 
all it would have done was the guys that won might very likely within it, except for a few times. Mm -hmm. There were a few times of people that that shot the winning scores, and it doesn't even matter which division, by barely hanging them into the tens, right? Right, or barely hanging them in the eights, right? Um, and there would have been people that shot a numerically lower score, would it would have been different because let's say somebody went out there and shot a few bad shots, but they were. Uh, didn't shoot as many X's for open. You might have had somebody that one year that, that, that dropped 10 X's or 12 X's that would have got beaten by somebody if that those points had been nines sure. instead of 10 still. Sure. And, and it could have it, you could have had the thing really change up. I don't think anything they'll do will make this match harder or, or suitably harder to matter um, because it's already so hard. Yes. That, that's one of its issues. That that I think you change the scoring around, you might be able to, to move, it might move people around a little bit and no longer will that thing be, be get it clean. You know, it's that 1920 and you know it because you know, you guys followed Adam last year and, right, right. and Metallic and it was all about, you know, oh my God, somebody finally is going to shoot a 1920 with Metallic. But, you know, if you compared to probably what his X count was, you can probably get a feel for what his numerical score would have been if there had been nines right, and, and it right. changes everything. I think there's also, and this again is something we've unpacked already, and that is that that changing the goal of the 1920, the attainable goal, it's a known entity, mm -hmm. you know, only a handful of people have ever done it, mm -hmm. but it is something that has been done. You take away that carrot from the regular shooter who has come back year after year and maybe achieved a 1914 or a 1916 mm -hmm. or even a 1918 and said, next year I clean it up, next year I get my 1920. As soon as you change that format, now that carrot for those individuals is gone. Well, it also throws out the whole history of it. So, I mean, the, the fact that, that, hey, I shot a 1920 in 19, you know, 89 or 91 or whatever, doesn't matter anymore. Right. Because it's, 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 when, it's when you change from running 100 yards to 100 meters. Right. Well, it didn't ra really matter now what the 100 yard times were. Right. Because 100 meters now is where it's all the measure, or the, is a litmus test. And I, and I think... I think part of what does drag people back is somebody that hasn't been here or hasn't shot this does not understand the lure of getting a 480, a 480 on an event. Mm -hmm. You know, there isn't a shooter here except for the open guys that wouldn't trade a 480-0X for a 478 x right. You know, it's, yeah. there isn't one of us that wouldn't trade that. Because it's the tens first, and the X's. The yeah. X's go back to the old days. Nobody, they never anticipated anybody cleaning any of these events, sure. John. That was that was when it was when when Chapman and uh, Richard Nichols designed this whole course of fire back in the late seventies. It was always designed to be something that couldn't be right. It was never going to be done. Never going to be done. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's ever going to be good enough to be able to, to shoot a, a 480 on an event. Yeah, maybe occasionally right. a 480, but a 1920? Like 480 all of them. Oh, my yeah. God. I, <laughs> the, the breaking of the 1900, when that happened in the, in the 80s, that was some sort of... It was voodoo. A vo yeah, there you go. It was <laughs> magic. You know, and, and, and those of us that saw it happen still can't believe, my, they shot the whole match only 20 points down. And now, you know, we've had production scores that are above 1,900. Yeah. And I mean, there was a time when the production division was rolled out and introduced right. that a 1,900 plus was going to earn you some major cash. That, and and we, that and, didn't last long. Oh, and we never thought it would happen. And we started shooting even back to Metallic. And when and under the current rules of Metallic, which the original rules were basically open with, optical, with no optical sights and no scopes or no comps. And and now the metallic metallic rules that don't allow you to grab it, and you can't have you know mover right. wings and all that kind of has changed it. So then we're like, oh, 1900. I mean, nobody's gonna ever shoot 1900, and, and now it's production. We've broken 1900 with production guns, and it you just if having not been here, you can't imagine what it's like to walk up and miss three plates, and know that now. You know, you can't make it. You can't make a nineteen hundred because yeah, you're, you're 30 if you're down, if you're dude. clean right now, yeah, you're, you're you're at eighteen ninety, yeah. and it's just it just sucks the life out of you, and it makes you go, oh, what can I do to make? Can I do this over? Yeah, and and you'll you'll stay you'll stay awake at night going like just one just one target would have given me a chance. And that's yeah, kind of that's, that's, that's kind of and that's what brings a lot of us back yeah. over for decades. Right. 
and just to drive to just have a better number than you had last time. Because you, the funny part is you'll practice, and you go out to the practice range, John, and you go talk to people. And there isn't a shooter out there that ha- won't tell you, oh, yeah, you know, my best run through this in practice is, you know, I shot a 1920 with, sure. you know, with my snubby. And then the match, you go to the match. Well, it's a different day, oh. and it's a different place. <laughs> it's a different and there are a lot of eyes, and then there are the cameras, <laughs> and there's, there's pressure. I mean, it's a real fact of life. It's it, a real thing. It, it's, the, it, it, it's doing it at the match is, is always going to be the standardized test for ability to perform under pressure at that match. It's yep. not like shooting IPSC match. It's not like shooting bullseye nationals. It's not high-power rifle. It's not IPSC world shoot. It's none of those things. It's a whole different level but I can't really put a finger on it. Maybe it's because we're we're scared to fail or we hate the concept of failing so much, but not enough to stay home and not come and try again. I think to an extent it's the fact that it is just the four events and yeah. that it is, it is so much hangs on each individual shot through each target. And the, the targets are small. The distances mm-hmm. are long. Mm-hmm. The transition to the weekend on, <laughs> on the practical. I mean, you just start adding up all of the challenges that make up this match. And, you, you know, you can balance that out. And it can be pretty daunting. But on the yeah. other hand, people who come here and do these events either at the highest level or even at, you know, a club level, even mm-hmm. in the kind of middle range. Anybody who has experience from these four events can apply those tools to the other shooting sports in Excel. I agree. I used to tell people that wanted to learn to be good. You know, mo- a lot of us shoot IPSC all the time or variations of USPSA or whatever. And I would always tell everybody that I think what, what really set the standard for skill in, from my generation of shooters was that we didn't have a lot of uh, practical matches. There weren't a lot of, there were no area matches and things like that. So we kind of had, were limited on what we could do. And if we wanted the opportunity to expose ourselves to shooting under performance or pressure and performing under pressure, we really only had the steel challenge. Right. We had the USPSA Nationals, which originally was IPSC USA, and yeah. we had the Bianchi Cup. Right. So even though most of like my group of people all came from the IPSC side, that was always our thing, right? you still, one match a year wasn't enough to make it happen, right? So you needed other opportunities. And the things you'd learn shooting the Steel Challenge were applicable to the other games. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is here. If you've come here, you can't solve this problem with aggression. Right. You know, that's, that's, that's one of the huge problems. And of all people, I was talking to Max one year, and I'm watching him shoot the mover, and he's just coming up and target comes out, just bang, bang, bang. I said, Max, you can't solve this the way you solve every other problem you right. shoot on. Right. It's not about draw and split time. No, here. it doesn't make any difference. And it's not about how quick you burn down the play <laughs> it rack. It doesn't matter. Right. It's whether you hit it or miss it. So, the, so not only the mechanical skill of being able to make that shot, but the discipline to force yourself to do something in a manner you don't always do it. I think that, that partially is, is the draw is because it's, it's, it's not cross-training. That's not really the right term. But it's... it's it's developing a level of skill that's out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. that then makes other things seem easy. It may be a fine polishing of the fundamentals of firearm yeah. accuracy, you know, mm-hmm. accurate shooting. If you have polished it to the level to compete here, yeah. those then can be applied everywhere. Yeah, I, I think that's, prob- you, that's probably as well worded as I've ever heard it. I just know that when I'm shooting well here, any other game I've ever played seemed easier. Yes. Not yes. easy, because it's Not never easy. easy. None of it's easy. None of it's easy. Right. But... But yeah. there, you get an advantage, and it, when you see a, a moving target that a course designer wants you to shoot with a pistol at a PRS match, mm-hmm. um, all of a sudden, that's really not that big a deal anymore. <laughs> it's really not that scary. <laughs> and to Kevin Worrell's credit, he was at the Rifles Only Brawl this year. and shot Did a, he go to that? He shot a 19 of 20 on the moving target. Wow. And I swear that 20th, he missed on purpose, but... Anyway, wow. it, was, it was neat to see him kind of emerge and, and do that. And it was like, wow, that's Kevin Worrell. Well, and, and, you know, one of the things, you know, Kevin has what he's perfected is the immediate accurate shot. Yep. He's, it, it, this match isn't slow enough to let you go squeeze, 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 bang, because you're just yep. going to run out of time. Yep. One of the things, Kevin's always been very, very fast. If you watch him shoot any of the strings of fire here, he's really quick. Yep. So that really applies in that same world. It's like ready, set, now. Yeah. And he doesn't have to play with it. He, he can shoot an accurate, well-controlled trigger pull immediately. Yep. And I can't. I don't know any game that wouldn't be valuable in. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, fun thing to watch, yeah. and to and to really kind of 
get an understanding of and then see those skills applied mm -hmm. elsewhere, especially when you see guys who stand out here yeah. go and apply those skills in other, in other yeah. disciplines. There are a lot of disciplines that you've shot. I mean, you've been shooting. You know, you've been, been around since the dawn of time. Thirty-seven <laughs> years. You've been here before television. Well, not really. But before, well, no, yeah. Before shooting sports before television. Sports that's for television. sure. I mean, we go back to '93, so you go well back beyond that. When you when you date it back in the early early days, ESPN sent a guy named Lenny McGill out, yep. and he would do a show, and it was a once a year show. That yep. wasn't it wasn't it like what you guys were doing, and they do a little half hour. And then Lenny Peace did his VHS tapes for a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah. He was still around when mm -hmm. we started in 93. He was still there and there. Yeah, he's, he's, he's actually still around and not involved in that side of the business anymore. But, I mean, he, that whole thing then, you would, <laughs> we are so spoiled now. You want to watch shooting or you want to learn about shooting or see shooting, your show's on every week, right? Well, you can go to the Internet. And, and you, you can then you can, can watch, and you can watch anything on the Internet. Right, forever. But, yeah. but new stuff. For us, when... When the Bianchi Cup show would come on, you know how many times it was on, right? Yeah. Once, and then a couple reruns through the course of the year, and that was and that's it. it exactly. yep. Now it's you know f as far as the the opportunity for shooters to see what's or enthusiasts to see what's going on. I mean, this is this is the we are in the we are the good old days right now. We're in the golden we're era in those of salad years. Yeah, we're the salad <laughs> years. That's it. <laughs> Makes me think of a Monty Python sketch uh, when you say that. So right? funny. Oh, man, it's good times. I was, uh, I was remarking today, I was telling a guy about the first time that we met and when we were at Paso Park, and it was in 93, and we were kicking hacky sack. I don't know if you remember yeah, that. Yeah, I remember. Well, that was a long, long time ago. That right? was a long, 93. Yeah. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm at that age now where I remember 1980 and not today. And then that's you know, it. That's <laughs> like, oh, and today, when you know, you shoot some of these events like we do now, you don't want to remember. You don't want to have a memory for How it. How many other shooters have been doing this particular game as long as you? I think I'm it for my generation. Everybody that was established in shooting when I started, and you've got to remember, I wasn't that far behind the beginning. You know, the first, right. the first USPSA National, I think, was in '77. World Shoot was in '76, and uh, the Columbia Conference was in '76, and so all of that's kind of started and got formally organized in the mid late '70s. And I was shooting at the local level in Arizona in 7980 right. so i was only a few years out so the the group that's that that was there before me none of them are nobody nobody's left i've out survived them anybody's come in within the couple years when i began um i think van schmidt might have actually been here a year before i was although i don't know if he's been at every one since right um, other than that, there's there's really nobody. You know, the next the next generational group would be Doug's group, sure. which are not that much shorter than me, but ten, seven, six, seven years. Eight. What is it for thirty seven years that keeps you coming back to this? Thing? I haven't figured it out. Well, I, I, ha I figured out why I come back. It's because I haven't figured out how to do it. Right. Every year when you come and shoot this thing, every single year, it doesn't matter how many thousands of rounds you practice and how many hours you spend on the range. It doesn't, none of that matters. When you finally come here, it's so humbling that, that you, it's like, you know, the old golf thing. I hate golf. I'm, right. It's the worst thing ever. What time are we doing it tomorrow? Yeah. It's kind of like that. <laughs> It's like you go to the Bianchi Cup, like, oh, my God, it, there's nothing more miserable than walking up there and having your knees start shaking. And I don't have it anywhere else or anything else I do, and it's the worst possible feeling. I'd rather go to the, I'd, I'd, I'd rather get, I'd rather go to the dentist and get a root canal sometimes <laughs> than, than the way that, the way you feel when you're up there. But when you walk away, good or bad, hit them or miss them. There's this relief period that at least I'm done with this right now. And then there's the set-in period where you go like, oh, I hit them all. Like last year when I hit them all, it's like yeah. I hit them all I standing. That was a fluke, you know. And then there's the years this year where you didn't do as well necessarily as you wanted to because you never hardly do. You always, you always feel you leave something on the table. And you, you go back and it just gnaws at you, John. And, and that's what keeps you coming back. Is, is, it's not the practice runs, although you learn so much in practice. It's part of it is the, the camaraderie and hanging out with shooters because I really like that. Mm -hmm. but, but it's that, that drive that, man, I know I can do better and I want to try again and I want to try again. You've got to wait a whole year to try again. Yep. Yep. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. And it's a known entity. And that, I think, is the thing for a lot of people. And another thing that I find interesting about this match, and I just want to get your take on it, is, is the fact that 
there's a whole contingent of international shooters, especially mm-hmm. the Australian New mm-hmm. Zealand group. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people. And mm-hmm. it is. I was talking with a guy who last year was his first year over. And, you know, the undertaking for he and his wife to come over here. In terms of dollars, he's talking between $9,500 and mm-hmm. $10,000 for the trip. And I said, what? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Why do you do that? Why not why go? Why would you do it? Go on vacation somewhere nice. Why are you going to go to Columbia, Missouri when it's hot? When there's and it's hard to get here. Yeah. It's it, not an easy destination to get to. Well, I think shooters are like that. I think as a rule, whatever it is that appeals to a person to be a shooter, and whatever appeals to that group of shooters to be somebody that is willing to put your put every part of you out in front of everybody and yep. and and live or die on the sword, you know. That personality type, when you take, take shoes in general, refine them to this little group that is willing to go and torture themselves like this, what is it about those people that want to do that? I mean, that guy probably has dreamed his whole shooting career of being able to come here and be part of this. Yes. Well, he told me he was high newcomer last year, which I thought was right. pretty cool. There Super you go. Nice there, that, so, so there's a drive to want to see how you stack up. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's, that's what it comes what it down. Is, yeah. You want to know how you stack up. And the best in the world are here, mm-hmm. and this is where you know. I mean, this is where you you put it out there and you find out. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you can you can type type a good game on your social media and your internet, and oh, you can yeah. you can put, put paste all these Facebook postings of all these awesome groups you shoot. But man, until you come and shoot <laughs> one here, <laughs> and it gets measured by them dudes <laughs> in the black and white shirts. <laughs> there's there's until some it goes away in a dry cleaner bag. <laughs> <laughs> it gets measured by the guy in a black and white shirt in and, the little tent. And then you stand there waiting for it to come out yeah, man. and go, holy crap, it looked better than that when I yeah. shot it. What happened? And yep, it's a different world. It is. It really yeah. is. It's fun. And one of the cool things about shooting in general is how easily you it's com- comparable. Because we have people from all over the world, but the Australians have really jumped all over it. You know, they have really really good shooters and the germans have really good shooters in mm-hmm. lots of different regions some of those places you know you allude to the dollars that they spend yeah some of those places it's really hard to do yeah no doubt in the u.s this is relatively cheap and easy to do yes in germany ammunition costs are so high that most people could never could never afford to even buy the ammunition it takes to become uh, good at this mm-hmm. and uh, you know the fact that people are driven so hard to do it when it's so hard and you know, come a long ways and spend ten thousand dollars to come and do this, I get it. You know, I went to France last year to shoot the world shoot. You know, and I'm way past my prime to run around, run around a range and chase kids. Right? Why do you do it? it says you got to know. Right. It's like the guy in in uh, Dirty Harry <laughs> at the beginning it says I got to know. Yeah. <laughs> you feel lucky? I don't know. I, I got I got to know, man. I got to know. Oh man, classic. Good stuff. Really, really fun stuff. I feel like we could go on for an hour. We could. Easily. <laughs> Easily. You got 37 years of you. <laughs> an hour or nothing. We need to do more of these. Yeah, we should. We really should. But that, uh, I think that wraps us up. You, mm-hmm. What do you have to do tomorrow? What's left for you? I have the barricade and the practical event. Oh, that's horrible. And it is terrible. I, I, I won't sleep tonight because I'll have nightmares because I'll remember the year that I shot clean and then I'll remember the years that I dropped 20 points and realize that while I was doing it, it looked exactly the same to me. <laughs> Figure that one out, yeah, brother. No, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, marinate on yeah, that yeah, for a second. Think about that for a second. <laughs> it's like throwing the dice, baby. Marinate on that for a second. Yeah. He's the great one. The one and only Rob <laughs> Latham. Rob, it's a pleasure. Oh, thank like you I for said, having me. Like I said, we should do more of these, and we will. We will. Let's do it. I'll have more from the Bianchi Cup 2018. Rob Vadaz from the Border Patrol. He's next. <laughs> 